the time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good comrades, good people, wherever you are in the world. This is another episode of the Pantsilla Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I am here with comrades Evan and Sadiq. We are here very glad to be organizers with the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which is the organization that is representing this podcast. The objective of the All African People's Revolutionary Party is a unified Africa under scientific socialism. If you have any questions in regards to that, feel free to ask us any questions, any queries you have, or go to the website, which is aaprp intl.com. O R G, and we will help you in any way we can. Before we begin the episode, of course, we must acknowledge our ancestors because without our ancestors, we would not be here doing the work at all. We would not be doing this organization, and we would probably not even be having this podcast. So, without further ado, Evan, who are our ancestors we are honoring today? Uh, our two ancestors will be Lillian Goyen. And Antonio, and Lillian Ngoi was a South African anti-apartheid activist. She was elected to Central Committee at the National Congress. She also helped launch the Federation of South African Women. Um, one of the things notable, she led she helped the um, a women's march on August 19, 1956. Um, it was called twenty thousand women from Victoria against apartheid government against the past. Against the past laws, the uh, law is a strong orator and and was very noble work as well in New York with the Burman Workers Union of South Africa. And our other ancestor is Anthony Diop. Uh, you might be familiar with his work of uh, improving or at least like, reasserting the Africanist of not only ancient Egypt, but also some of the commonalities between. Of various groups and within Africa. Uh, he was a Senegalese historian, anthropologist, physicist, and politician, and his works are noble for playing our uh, past. Some of his scholarship has for some reason either because they think it's too Afrocentric with it, I find which is kind of laughable considering the extent that uh, much the study of our history gets has often been whitewashed either before. Uh, Diop's work, or even after, I think that he's been a very influential in listening our yes, and as a Pan Africanist as well. So those we are two ancestors. I all want to thank them for all the work they've done, regardless of how how they've done it, and I want to raise them and thank them for those continuing our work. So I'm going to pass it off to Amanda Sadiq to get us going on the topic for our podcast this week. So as many of you know, uh, the other day, Queen Elizabeth II has passed away. Um, Queen Elizabeth was the Queen of England. Uh, She lived until 96. So this episode is going to be centered around why the royal family is not your friend. Um, You know, because of her passing, you know, we've seen a lot of, at least those that are on social media, seeing a lot of different opinions on Queen Elizabeth, her history, and, you know, some people mourning and grieving and saying, you know, sympathetic things about Queen Elizabeth. And you have other people who are talking about the colonial and imperial history of Britain um, under her rule. So with that being said, I guess I'll kick it off and ask the question, which is the title of this episode, is why is (laughs) the royal family not considered our, at least our friends in terms of African people and other colonized people as well. Well, One reason uh, that the royal family is not friendly is because if you've seen any pictures of all the wealth 
and pageantry and luxuries that they have. Much of that, you know, most of it is taken from this photos of the many centuries of the British Empire. When you think about the jewel, some of the diamonds and things coming from Africa, from parts of Africa, from the South Asia or Caribbean or or else or other parts of Asia, that a lot of that from the super exploitation of whether it be enslaved Africans or indentured servants or, or other kind of people from as many from as many reaches or as they used to call it, the sun never set on the British Empire. Because of how much they're taking on the various uh, parts of the global cell. And this is not even including the fact that it's a remnant of the fuel empire within the United Kingdom and its exploitation of the peasants and the serfs within its nation, not to mention the, the continued uh, colonization of Ireland. And think about the fact that so many people now speak English, while some of it has come from the hegemony of the United States is pretty much started with the left of the British Empire. And not to mention, even from the family, their biggest uh, landlords and like really the biggest landlords in the world. And if you think if you think you don't like your landlord, I think about a landlord that now you had, as we talked about before, that not only you never agreed to, that you never agreed to say, oh, I own it for, for a little price. They say, okay, you got to live here. You got to speak our language. You got you to gotta do our customs. You got to do this and that. So, so, if you're, so if you're crying over a landlord, uh, that says a lot about the power of the Fed, um, cultural hegemony, and the what, decades and centuries of colonies have done to you. So that's, that's a couple of big reasons why not, we're not fans of them. So. <laughs> I'll give a more recent example. In 2010, if I'm not mistaken, the Queen asked for a poverty grant for the heating of their facilities. So the cost of that facility was about, I think, uh, 708,000 pounds. If you translate that into dollars, it's a little bit more. So the costs were so high, the queen decided to ask for a poverty grant. Of course, the ministers refused that because, well, that would be so controversial and uh, that would be such a backlash in terms of PR. But the money that is supposed to be allocated towards uh, low-income families hospitals, schools, those kind of things. The queen was asking for that money to be allocated towards lowering the heating bills. Those people are not your friends. Mm. They are not your friends. And I think what happens is that people tend to romanticize celebrity. People tend to uh, just look at the symbolism of it, that this is one of the uh, highest positions in the land. A, why is there still, whether or not it's in quote-unquote active monarchy, it's still a representation of soft power because you have Canada still pledging allegiance to the queen. You have, why is the Australian flag still have a portion of the British flag on there? Like all of these representations of soft power do exist. Why is it that you need a figurehead of monarchy if you claim to be a democracy? Those things cancel each other out. So this idea that, well, she doesn't do anything. She pets horses or, you know, she just walks around weaving. It's still a representation of soft power. There's still that extension, as you mentioned, why are people speaking the English language? Why are people still using British currency? People are using the pound around the world. Why are these things in existence if indeed the facets of British imperialism didn't exist around the world. So I think that to recognize that, it's not a problem to understand. Like, you don't have to wish death upon somebody to not mourn them. Like for me, I am a person, like I don't want that on my spirit. As a person who literally almost died, I don't want that in my spirit wishing that on someone else. That is just me. But I'm not going to celebrate these individuals, these figureheads of imperialism, because of the damage those figureheads participated in. 
that they were silent about, that they had a hand in, whether directly or indirectly. So that's another reason <laughs> that we should never acknowledge these people as being good. I see the queen, I see all of those people as uh, being in the same position as Margaret Thatcher, Margaret the Milk Snatcher, or Boris Racist Johnson. The, to me, they all represent the same aspect of empire, the same aspect of racist imperialist policy, colonial policy. So we don't have to celebrate these people or mourn these people when we are very directly affected by that and are impacted negatively. That's my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think to your point too, like in relation to the morning, this part of what you were saying, like I, for me, it's kind of like, um, you know, these people, for instance, when you think of like NATO and the destruction of Libya and Gaddafi, you know, British had a role in that, had a play in that there in NATO. Um, you know, you think of the suppression of the Mamba movement in Kenya. You know, this was actually during Queen Elizabeth II's reign, too, as well. She was uh, asserted as the queen as well. So you could think of various moments where she was in that position that she was in, um, you know, as a, I guess, personification of the colonial imperialist power um, of Britain um, or vestiges of that, you know. She didn't <laughs> take a, a stance against these things. You know, if anything, she was you know, for these things. It was in her best interest to be for them as well. Um, so I think uh, another thing that I was seeing online, I guess, in the same line of this conversation was that, um, oh, you know, Queen Elizabeth didn't really have anything to do with a lot of that imperial stuff. You know, she was... <laughs> She 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 over she oversaw the decolonization of a uh, various third world or global south countries. Like you know, isn't that a good thing? You know, the fact that she oversaw that period of liberation struggles, and she was pretty much the one, kind of making it seem as though she was the one who led these these struggles, or she was the one who gave these people their liberation or freedom, independence. All right, so I guess if you guys want to unpack that a little bit uh, in relation to some of those talking points. So the, the, the queen herself single-handedly saved <laughs> several countries in the world. The masses of the people had nothing to do with that, right? Is that what you're saying? The masses yeah. of the people had nothing to affect change. Is that, okay. is that what you're really telling me? Yeah. So you see people saying online, it's, it's like uh, you gotta you gotta praise her because she was she was uh, at the helm when all that happened. So. Why why would the if the queen was for the people, the queen definitely was was not for young girls when Jimmy Savile was knighted. I'll tell you that. So these people had a hand in protecting child predators. The queen is not your friend. <laughs> and not to mention Prince Andrew, but she protected him when we talked about the relationship of him with uh, Jeffrey Epstein and say Maxwell. So again, they are not your friend. They're not your friend. And another and another point about the whole decolonization point is it's a bit like how like people want to say, oh, uh, England they bought slavery. Let's see how great they were. They bought slavery. They, mm -hmm. they had, you know, honestly, um, well, in the case of both, it's the ending of slavery. Of uh, course, uh, if you read the uh, a red book, uh, Capitalism of Slavery by Eric Williams, you, you'll find out that uh, they, that slavery ended, you know, talk about um, one man, people, uh, Wilberforce, uh, that the reason they ended slavery wasn't out of some like oh, we suddenly we suddenly find these people human. It's not it's not about that. It's the fact that they found it was that the cost of maintaining that just wasn't worth it. So and they figured that of transitioning to um, or industrial capitalism, uh, that they they didn't need that super exploitation of, of slavery from a, from slavery to keep their keep capitalism going. 
that's why they that's why they stop with it. It's not again, it's not out of some humanism they found. And in the case of colonization, like, colonization is that of like we, we talked about um, the land and freedom party in Kenya, or we talk about uh, Yem, Yemen or um, um, the quote unquote Malaya emergency or or elsewhere or against any of the NATO uh, any NATO events that they like, they stop because you know, like the cost of maintaining all that all those uh, defense all the defense all that weaponry is over they just found it wasn't worth it. And again, and as we talked about in previous episodes, there's still something as neocolonialism. So even if they're not direct colonies, like like they have, like they still have in certain places, that they still extract um, profits. They still get um, extra value from some of the nations that they have previously colonized, or in places they had they hadn't colonized, but. Have, but British capital still happened to be there. So again, they're not doing out any sort of sudden change of morals. It's about whether they find it worth it on a monetary standpoint. That's it. I did want to say this as people are mourning these figureheads of oppression. There are folks out here who have been doing a lot of work organizing around uh, economic justice, environmental justice, uh, doing work in order for indigenous people to get land back. And I do, we did honor a couple of ancestors, but I did want to mention some other folks who are being mourned rightly. So there was, uh, this was uh, in the early 2000s. So it was uh, Zenin Diaz Nekul. So these are uh, two individuals in the Mapuche nation, which I am acknowledging right now. So uh, Zenin Diaz Nekul, 17 years old, was run down by a truck. I was also run down by a truck, so I know how that is. So uh, Zenin Diaz Nekul, uh, was participating uh, in actions against uh, the Menenico uh, company, which is a forestry company. And so people are always doing work against deforestation, of upholding the land, uh, making sure that uh, corporations, capitalist entities, do not steal the land and use it for profit. So that is one person. There's another person who is in his 20s named Pablo Manchat. So people are honoring these people right now. And the Mapuche people are demonstrating and organizing against the ravages of capitalism. So this is who we should be honoring, people doing the actual work against colonialism, against capitalism, against imperialism for people to have land rightly returned to them. And yet news coverage all over the place. I don't watch TV, but of course I hear about it. News coverage everywhere about this queen, this queen who had no love for the people, try to take get grants for people who didn't have the similar incomes so they could reduce uh, what, Really think about this. Think about who we emphasize. Think about who we admire. Why? Why would you ad admire someone who literally is not out here in the front lines doing the work? I just have a question for people. So just keep in mind the folks who are doing the work, like Pablo Marchand, people like. Zinan Diaz Neku. I just wanted to mention these two, as well as our ancestors we honor every week and in the future. These are the people actually doing the work, and yet they are not recognized. I don't think it's important that you know they be on the headlines or whatever, and that you know they are held in the same status as a celebrity, because <laughs> celebrities aren't for the most part out here doing that kind of work. So that's. Now what I'm saying, they should be celebritized. But what I'm saying is that as we 
fantasize about being in these particular positions, as we fantasize that uh, I will one day be a part of uh, a capitalist enterprise, as we think about that, how much do you have to sacrifice in terms of your humanity to get there? Do you think that these people in the royal family did not sacrifice their humanity? They didn't even think about humanity. If that was the case, they all would have committed class suicide if they were really thinking about the humanity of the people. So as we celebrate these figures, think about how much people sacrificed in order for all of us to be here. The queen didn't do that. We're not here having this conversation because the, the queen sacrificed something. We're here because Kwame Nkrumah sacrificed. We're here because Kwame Ture sacrificed. We're here because Asada Shakur sacrificed. That's why we're here. So think about that when you think about who inspires you, when you think about why you are here doing the things that you are doing. That's my second TED Talk. It'll probably be a couple more, but I just uh, encourage everyone to think about that. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you guys are dropping some heat right there. Um, I think another question that, that came to mind, too, is, I guess, more so, why do we see Africans so enamored by monarchies, not only in, like, more modern nations around the world, i.e. England, or today with Queen Elizabeth's death, but also, in particular, African nations or empires back in the ancient times or in antiquity? Why do we see Africans so enamored by this and always using this as a point of reference? Um, more so, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but you know, I think sometimes it gets mystified or uh, you know, over glorified in relation to, or even outside of that, just in general, like oh, they talk about kings and queens of all nations. Oh, we was kings and queens. Da, da, da. Like, why do we see that overemphasis on that? Didn't I just do an episode about that with Jay Z? I think that answers a lot of your question. It's like, we want to be in a particular position and we see folks in that position. Whether or not uh, they exploited people, I don't think that's something that is put into question. People just see the position and they desire that. But what, again, does it take to get there? You have to be exploiting people in order to be a billionaire. You have to be exploiting people in order to be uh, part of royalty. You have to be uh, exploiting people in order to amass a particular amount of wealth. Like no one's a billionaire simply uh, because they uh, treated the masses kindly. Like where have we seen that? So I, I don't think that you know, when thinking about mourning these folks, people, again, are not making those connections of oppression and exploitation. And I think when people say, oh, you know, as Africans, we were kings and queens. If that were the case, why are we, why are Africans in the position we're in? If we were all kings and queens, we would all be having the seat at the table uh, as the same position as the colonizers. So that literally makes no sense that we were all kings and queens. If we were all kings and queens, then there wouldn't be enslavement of people. <laughs> so <laughs> it, 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 none of that makes sense. And I think I, I, I understand why people say things like that because they need to be able to uh, do something or think in a particular way that they can strive towards something. It, it's the power of representation. So when you see a Black Panther, that's the power of representation. It's this uh, idea that, you know, this is what we can achieve, but what's the fine print in between? The CIA dude was the ultimate quote unquote hero in the movie, which closed itself off, Wakanda off from the rest of the African world. When you had the figures that did, uh, make attempts to unify Africans globally, they were killed off. So think about the intricate details of these plots and what Hollywood and what uh, capitalism will and will not green light. We have to really think about that and not just the end result of something or what we hope and what we wish. 
But I think the answer to your question, you discussed that when you were discussing uh, Jay-Z and him equating being called capitalist with being called a racial epithet, which literally makes no sense since uh, I doubt if Jay-Z read The Wealth of Nations. I doubt if, if you are reading any capitalist theorist, if you think capitalism was a word that was made up to uh, put Africans down. Like how do, uh, how do you equate uh, uh, an individual coming up into the world with a whole system of oppression, a whole system of land grabbing? How, how does one equate that unless they haven't studied that system? Oh uh, yeah, I think too, I think um, I'm, in, I'm definitely in agreement with everything you said, I think uh, just to accentuate one of the points you made is just, I think because we've been oppressed for so long and dispossessed and, you know, dealing with the terror of living under the white supremacist, imperialist, capitalist, you know, nation, uh, the biggest one being the U.S., um, that we kind of just want to cling to any sense of feel good you know, like, oh, okay, this gives me that sense of feel good. And obviously the ones who are putting that picture or creating that sense of feel good are the same enemies who enslaved us and continue to oppress us. Oppress us. So they want to give you this false notion of, oh yeah, like, you know, you were once quote unquote kings and queens, you know, you guys were explorers like us, <laughs> um, whatever. So they try to give us that in a way. And not only them, but, you know, there's other folks who are out here trying to push that narrative and probably for the same reasons is they also deal with, you know, psychological effects, the material effects of being oppressed. So, you know, they just want to feel good. They just want to, you know, escape reality and not really deal and look at the nuances of, OK, self-interrogation in a sense. Like, OK, so these people are kings and queens. How do they get there? Like. You know, we all work in the Queens. Like, how do they, you know, get to that status? Like, how did that social stratification take place over time? And so forth and so on. I just look in the details and do a real historical analysis of, of that. So, so, yeah, for sure. If, they, if, they're, if they're monarchs of any kind, like, who, who are they ruling over? You know? Exactly. Well, and, and I'm not sure there is, there is, there is certainly, um, as we brought like some of the answers we honor were indeed in monarchs, were indeed some of those kings we talk about who who were vital against either fighting against the slave trade, fighting against uh col colonization and, and they were important. I think I think a lot of it is like lack of understanding of this or of, of that dialect of like of of the battle against the, our subjugation as well as the fact that even even so, there's still there's still there's still an internal contradiction, and and we and we see that um thing that, for example, if, uh, we talk you know we talked about uh with the struggle in uh, Swaziland or, or so, East Swatini of of working 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 of the working class there against the against the monarch or King Swati the third uh, who so, who is repressed. Who's been very repressive and anti-democratic, and oh, and again, like do you hear much about that? Like, that is that we're that, we're, that there is a a movement to make sure that uh that not all are in fight, fighting against the imperialists, uh, uh, and one of the things of uh, the fight, fight against King Swati is that uh, he is getting a lot of assistance from different imperialist nations. Who are supportive of like that they're able to get cheap labor there. So again, and that's mentioned some of the pictures we know one thing is we've been talking we talked about some bit about uh some of the advanced you uh, passive present uh, organization of the oh, of Ethiopia uh, among some pan Africanists or some people who 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 look towards the Towards them as sort of as sort of like examples to follow, examples to to look after. While at the same time, uh, like not, with a lack of understanding of some of the role of internal colonization and their complicity with colonization um, and neocolonial uh, rulers, and 
and again, I, I think it's, again, it's like sort of how much uh, class and how much uh, how much like class is sort of like shipped away, and like and how there's not understanding of okay of like not of understanding of, like the, the the differences between um like these like singular people and like the mass of the people I think is a uh, some um there are like inculcation of that. Oh yeah. Uh, another thing too for me, I don't know if any of you guys are more familiar with Princess Diana um history. I don't I'm not really familiar with her history and you know I know she I think she died pretty much kind of young. I don't know the whole background to it, but if you guys do know the history, because there's a lot of talk of, you know, some people I've seen online and other spaces just saying like, oh, you know, this is kind of like Queen Elizabeth passing away is a get back for, you know, Princess Diana or like trying to make it seem as though there's a big distinction or, you know, in in relation to the interests of Princess Diana and Queen Elizabeth as if uh, Princess Diana was probably um, more like liberatory or whatever. Um, I don't know the whole story, so yeah. if any of you guys could kind of tap into uh, that and explain that. <laughs> explain so the interest in yeah. Diana Spencer was not necessarily liked by that family. Uh, or Diana, Princess of Wales, or whatever you want to call Diana Spencer. So she waged a huge campaign against the landmines and then also brought to light um, the uh, AIDS epidemic. So all of these things where the quote unquote royal family, they were a little bit more silent on and were not necessarily into her waging these particular campaigns, her uh, doing photo ops with Africans, that sort of, that's what, like, oh, you know. So she was sort of uh, the outcast of the family, uh, if you will. That doesn't mean that, like, oh, she was the greatest person ever. But in context of your question, yeah, she was considered a little bit of an outcast. She also um, ended up going out with this dude, Dodi Al Fayed, who was Muslim, I think. And so they were not very favorable about that either. So that goes back to the racism that even, uh, what's the couple now? So people compared uh, her, what's the, the, the woman that's African or part African? So she got compared to Diana Spencer. Um, and so people were talking about the racism that exists in that family towards her. I can't remember her name right now, but. So I, uh, they got compared in that they were quote unquote outcasts. So Diana Spencer did uh, do a few public campaigns, uh, particularly against the landmines. And she was gonna do several things before uh, she uh, passed. I think she was murdered, but that's a whole other, other story. People blamed it on paparazzi, but she did write, uh, again, I don't know that much either but i know she did write notes uh handwritten notes saying that she was going to be murdered so mm -hmm. i don't know but still that doesn't uh i remember when all of that happened but she still was part of that whole family dynamic of the royal family so i don't think that she should be absolved of any of that either but i know that uh, answering your question there were some campaigns that they were not necessarily happy about that she was uh, participating in. Yeah, and I get, and I go, and I go back to you point about the race, races is that that I think for a long time they they did not again they they did not allow like, not not Europeans to work uh, within like, within like, the confines of the palace. So and I don't know, I, so again. Even if you think, oh, she's so nice, but like even probably to the day, they didn't. I'm not sure like how whether it's good for her or not, but even like before, like before she passed on, they didn't didn't allow Megan to come, make you know, Megan Markle, by the way, like to come see her. So again, if if you have any concern about personally, like, the more like like interpersonal racism, 
uh, this, 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 like, even beyond like, what we talked about, about what, like, the uh, centuries of colonialism, imperialism, uh, as a result, of, and the racism behind it, and all that extraction of wealth, like, even with like her as a person, like, she wasn't a fan, she wasn't a fan of the melanated. So, <laughs> yeah, and like, why, why are you crying for her? Especially if you are, if you're, when you see the product of the colonization that the British Empire did. So, again, yeah, let's chill. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too. I've, I've seen, uh, you know, a few things from the capitalist media. And, um, it's funny too. They, uh, they interviewed a few people on the streets. One person I seen in specific, uh, you know, seemed like they were like, yeah, I'm not really a big fan of her because the, you know, her history with the imperialist colonial legacy of her um and you know britain in general but then a few other people they uh interviewed it was like as one person in particular she's like she was such a nice person you know she went to africa and you know she was very nice and you know but i, I guess i guess it's a twofold question i'm about to ask really but why do we see people try to regulate people's policies and um material impact to just emotions and sen uh, sentimentality um you know how the person was and uh why do we also see that the capitalist media always don't like to intertwine that impact and when they're given an overview of the life of someone who's at the helm of an imperialist nation because it protects the empire so if you were to actually discuss the effects of colonialism on the people you're asking, if they were to actually tell you <laughs> the truth of that, then it would inspire other people to do research on that. It would inspire other people to begin organizing. So if what you do is emphasize, oh, Diana was a nice person without addressing her role in that empire, if you only uh, emphasize, oh, the queen liked to, she was surprised when she saw cows or something, or if- <laughs> Or look at the cute corgis. Exactly. <laughs> if that's what you emphasize, it's sort of these human interest stories and it's getting away from, again, the actual impact of their policies. And people do not discuss policies. They talk about personalities. It's the same thing when people talk about presidents. It's when, oh, we have to get Trump out of office without understanding that uh, Biden's role as a senator was just as white supremacist. But, it's like, but because Trump is so outwardly white supremacist to people, they do not see the covert white supremacy. And I wouldn't even say it's covert, but I'll, I'll give you that. You know, um, even if, if Biden's saying, if uh, you're black and don't vote for me, you're racist, just the gaslighting, people somehow forget about that. So people forget about all these things. It's too early to speak ill of the dead. All of the, their whole life <laughs> was around ill action. So why would I not speak about that? Why would I not speak about the, their hand in imperialist policies just because they're not physically here. That doesn't make any sense. So it's doctored to create this human interest story and to further uh, humanize them in this way that detracts from their evil actions because it because it protects the empire. Uh, that if we're if we're questioning the people that they they're covering, then at some point they're going to question the media itself. That it is that the media is not really something apart from the from the capitalist um, Harold's hegemony. It's the patriarchal hegemony. It's it is it is it <laughs> that they have their own reason to for profit to do those, those sort of things. So they not they're not going to do anything that. Yeah, even if there are some, like, ask some members, some journalists, some the smaller, or, or even within some of the larger um, corporate news uh, stations, some places like where these are investigative journalism or anything that would be considered 
again against what's against the ruling class, it, it's gonna you're gonna put limits to that. So so again, they don't want a if they implicate what's defined, then it's gonna be the implication themselves. Yeah, and then I think oftentimes when we probably do see them uh talking about some of the bad things, they kind of just give a you know, surface level analysis or overview of what happened and, you know, oh, this one bad time she did this, but she corrected it later on. She was very empathetic about it or people close to her said she felt this way or whatever the case is. Like, they, those are the games that the capitalist media plays because once again, you know, they want to keep their hands clean to, you know, at least make it appear that they're keeping their hands clean to the masses, um, you know, so forth and so on. So I'm also interested to know how you guys feel about people who on one end may call out her horrendous legacy, especially amongst the global South um, and British, not just her and not individualized, but just British imperialism, colonialism altogether. But then on you know the second hand, when midterms or elections comes up again, then everyone is back to, you know, let's vote for it. <laughs> let's vote for Biden or let's, you know, let's get this Democrat in or let's vote for this other white supremacist or, you know, and not really have analysis or anything else. You know, why do we see that, you know, on one end someone can celebrate and be like, oh yeah, you know, she was a terrible person and what she said for was horrendous, but then on the other end, want to go and vote for the same group of people who inflict this terror to the global South specifically amongst African people. Cognitive dissonance, 10 seconds or less. <laughs> <laughs> Cognitive dissonance, it's, it's not only that, but it's only thinking within the four walls of wherever you're located. People who vote in the U.S. that think that way do not understand that U.S. policy is everywhere. U.S. imperialist policy affects the whole world. It also affects the U.S. So sanctions affect not only Cuba, which is a blockade, but uh, sanctions also affect locally. People do not think about those things. They think about, well, we need to get someone in the Supreme Court. And despite the massively racist history of the of the U.S. Supreme Court, people only think in terms of, well, the Republicans are so far over here, we need to sort of bring them to center. That is what people think about without thinking about history. And so people understand that Biden is a racist, but Trump is much more of a racist. So people want soft racism so they can feel better about going about their daily lives. Uh, if somebody is a 1 billion percent racist or how people perceive the 100 billion percentile of racism, then you cannot go about your day and you're gonna be uh, filled with anxiety versus, okay, yeah, I, I know this country's racist, but I can personally go about my day. So a cognitive dissonance has to happen so people can feel some level of comfort. Uh, they know that uh, you know, Palestine is stolen land, but it doesn't directly affect me. So I can have cognitive dissonance because uh, Roe v. Wade directly affects me. College loans directly affects me. So that is what people think about when they vote. So you're able to uh, make this separation, which is in the long run, very damaging if you're only thinking about uh, just one or two issues. Because again, those things are affecting the whole world. It's affecting colonized people because again, the laws that you're thinking about have already negatively affected many people in this country. So um, even, even uh, what was uh, going on uh, in France where Marie Le Pen, people continued to support Macron because they didn't want Marie, even though everyone's just like, well, I don't like Macron, but he's not as bad as Marie Le Pen. So that's what people were thinking about. It's the same exact thing. It's just like, I, 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 I get he's bad, but he's not as bad. So like, I want to be comfortable with, with going about my day. So it, it, 
you have to have a, a certain level of cognitive dissonance to think that way. It's almost like if you want to get shot or stabbed, you know, like how you want to go out. Yeah. <laughs> you you want to get you you want to be shot in the back or in the heart. It's just mm-hmm. <laughs> you want to be bitten <laughs> by a bear or a wolf or you know a puppy or what whatever. It's that's cognitive dissonance. Exactly. And, and, and it's, it's so funny. Uh, and if, even when you think about the the whole point of like why like even though we you know even though we talk so much about the fourth of the lie. Like why I think we celebrate the fourth of the July? Because to get away from England, get away from the monarchy, and yet how much mm-hmm. the, uh, how much of that is still discussed in, in corporate news, it, and you and people still buy buy for it. Like it says a lot about like as like Gramsci and others have spoken about the whole culture hegemony that like you you know like, you don't like, you you're bombarded by all this. So often, so much that at some point, uh, it becomes difficult to discern fact. And then, even when like you start questioning, like some people, uh, like one thing that one thing I did find ironic, but it's a funny coincidence is, uh, uh, if anyone remembers the uh, a far, it's a long, long time, most of the time, like presidential uh, uh, candidate Lyndon LaRouche, who spoke about uh, Queen Elizabeth II being like the biggest drug dealer. <laughs> Uh, and, yeah. but, and the funny thing was that she 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 died on what would have been his birthday. <laughs> oh wow! And <laughs> and, yeah, and, 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 and like it's funny, like, uh, like even if you like like this is not like endorsement or, or any was like positions. Uh, the thing is, is that like, like if you if you point out. Oh, he said something negative about the Queen Elizabeth. Like, people think like that's nice a lady, and you know, they have no power. Like again, it's like, like, like you. I, I think this gets into other things. Like when people like they'll point out like or like the more what do say what do say out there. Uh, um, what they'll they'll talk about anything is conspiracy theory, uh, but and so forth. And so that if you even if you have something that has like clear evidence about. Um, uh, example like they are maybe not really going to be um now rebellion or the uh, revolt or the or the squashing of of Yem- of Yemeni resistance or of the or the Kaddish of the Chagos the Chagos Islands and to build a U.S. military base in the in the Indian Ocean and like like build the same. And like you know, just saying, oh well, like, as we said before, like they'll just say, oh, this is you didn't really have power. Like, oh, oh, all the Spain the prime minister, or they're playing on this, uh, or they're playing on oh, this conservative or, or labor party, or or is this company or all oh, this but nothing on the royal family. And again, like if you and I know they talk about this like, news talks about how how well traveled she was, but. She wasn't. She wasn't just traveling for vacation. Like, yeah, we probably don't have to do so. But it was. It was just. <laughs> it's just like why do they still have to like? You know, if, 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 well, of course, they had the Commonwealth Games and Commonwealth. Like, even if it's not like a direct again, like in the direct foundation, it's still like uh, influence of the British, of the British Empire, and like still like the soft power of, of the UK. So, again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, again, it's, it's not just you just have to it's a bit, um, just importance of like of studying like, together and like, understanding all these things. Yeah, it's uh so crazy, man. How everything gets gets reshaped. But like you said, it's <laughs> oh yeah, she was going out there because she just wanted to, you know, vacate somewhere in Acton. <laughs> not saying they say this verbatim, but that's pretty much what they're implying. Like, oh, she's going on there. It's uh, do missionary work or something um out there but yeah it's not the reason but I, there was a recent statement that i've seen dl hughley i don't know if you guys are familiar with him the comedy who was a part of the whole kings of comedy uh stand-up tour with like bernie Mac, steve harvey and others uh or and then just said the standing standards i think it's all of them and uh he was saying that pretty much it's bad timing essentially i'm just uh summarizing 
what he was saying. This is not what he said book for word, but he was pretty much insinuating that it's bad time to bring up her history um, or her implicit, her being implicit in uh, British colonialism slash imperialism. Um, so I just want to get y'all takes on that per se and him saying that. Like we should Again, probably ignore that. Yeah. Why would it be a bad time to acknowledge something that's centuries old just because an individual is it like the legacy lives on? There's other people in the family. Didn't uh uh was it Charles is now king? I don't know, whatever. So why is it too soon? It's it's uh police kill people all the time within seconds of judge, jury, and executioner. And then they, the person who was murdered is demonized consistently in media. Is it too soon for that? I mean, I, I, I don't, it's like, again, cognitive dissonance. So when, when it, when is it going to be a good time to do that, to address that? What, eight years from now? <laughs> what, when? I guess so. Maybe like, you know, a few more weeks, you know, it's got to give us some time, you know, let her bury, let them bury her first, you know, show some, show some class, okay? <laughs> some decorum, <laughs> some decorum, yeah, okay, of course. But, um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, with that being said, with um, her passing away, because, you know, the, you know, as you stated, you know, the impact that, it, that, the legacy of British colonialism has is already there. Uh, I guess going forward, you know, because we live in this individualistic culture under capitalism, where because one figurehead dies, you know, they think that oh, things are going to go change, or because of someone who had a terrible legacy in the past, once they pass away, that the whole system is going to come down and something new, which is automatically going to be asserted. So, how do we forecast the? Uh, the future of British now that she passed away, do we feel like it's going to be completely different from what she, what was happening under her rule, or, or you know, do we foresee that it's going to go in a different direction, um, given that just because she passed away? The, nothing's going to change until the empire falls. Yeah, um, and what we just is um, you can't uh, if the wind dies and you're planning to have a strike. And you decide not to strength you know, respect for the way uh, you have some work to do. You got a lot of work to do if that's mm -hmm. what you can do. Exactly. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, the masses lead the movements, not you know, just because some you know, you get that whole idea is like, oh, we gotta let the old generation of racists die out, you know, the new generation is, you know, not that it's like I don't know what <laughs> what world you live in. Um, but yeah, that's, it doesn't work that way. So if people saying that the old generation has to die out, but you see people who are here right now who are pretty young, first of all, we could all go at any time regardless of how old we are. So I'm tired of that saying. <laughs> Second of all, uh, there are people here who still hold those same white supremacist capitalist, like, for example, Jay-Z, or if you want to talk about uh, all these young dudes in their 20s talking about Consent is a myth. Like you want to talk about that or incels or whatever. Like there's people who are young who still hold these ideologies. So you can't talk about age being a framework of oppression. That makes no sense because there are young people who still uphold these ideas as truth. You have all of these uh, white supremacists organizing. You want to talk about January 6th or whatever. Like everybody that was... Uh, there was not 78 years old. So this excuse about age and how people need to die out, uh, all these people who voted for Joe Biden, I'm sure not everybody was 75 years old. So stop talking about age as an excuse. Like, I, I'm tired of that. <laughs> I just yeah. wanted to say that. Yes. Yeah, you only think of like the Proud Boys. I'm like, kind of you're saying, I'm pretty sure everyone. Exactly. And when you think about the people who are doing this massacre shooting, shooting massacres in these schools and stuff like that. Like, like uh, people, boys or whatever, on Patreon and all mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, like they have AARP, you know, you know, like they get ARP magazines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
A- you don't need AARP, but you need AAPRP. I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you need. So I guess uh, is there any last statements or things you guys wanted to talk about before we wrap this episode up in relation to this topic? Celebrate people actually doing the work for the people. Stop celebrating these figureheads of oppression. Stop celebrating capitalism. Stop thinking that capitalism can be tweaked. Stop thinking that some small form of it can be a solution. It is the people, as we've been saying, who create the ultimate change. But we have to do that in an organized way. So join an organization. That's how we're going to do this. Or find your own. Get to work. Get to working. Get to working. Join the organization fighting for justice. If you guys haven't heard us say it before, it's your first time listening to the episode, one of our episodes, then uh, get used to it because when you go play back our other episodes, you're going to hear us say <laughs> And we're not saying it because it's a catchy thing to say or it's because it's cool. Actually, it's actually not cool <laughs> to say or I guess like uh, the most popular thing to say. So we're not saying it. Even if it was popular, we wouldn't be saying it for that reason. We're saying it because that's the only way we could change these these material conditions that Africans live under. So, and if you're not African, you know, other oppressed, colonized groups. Um, so yeah, so definitely appreciate you guys tuning in to another episode of the Pansula Podcast. <clears throat> Just wanted to mention that we have a set of comrades in Burkina Faso. For those of you guys who don't know about Burkina Faso, it's uh, located in West Africa, and not too far from Ghana. Um, we have uh, comrades out there who have a political education center. So we definitely need your help in sustaining that with political education center. Uh, you know, we have um, a lot of kids and people within um, the community out there that we're entrenched in who rely on it um, and that we provide our services to. So if you can, please, please help donate it. The link will be in the bio. So please help us out there. Um, and we also implore you, if you want to support our work outside of what we do with Burkina Faso, just in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, you could also shop at uh, our Ford Ever shop where we have our merch as well. Super dope merch. Uh, we should be coming out with more, more pieces soon, more designs. So definitely um, tap in when you can. And then we also implore you guys to check out our other podcasts. Uh, so we also have the Ford Ever podcast on Spotify. We also have the AAPRP Southwest chapter, uh, which airs their episode bi-weekly. And then we also have the Revolutionary African Women. And then we also have our Ancestors Voices, which is done by our comrades, uh, Ajamu Umi and Shakura Umi. So definitely uh, check them out. Great content, great stuff. Uh, so yeah, once again, thank you guys for joining. And as you stated before, if you're not an organization, you want an organization fighting for justice, um, you know, because to, to me, if you're babbling on about, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that, and you're not organizing around it, then to me, you don't, you don't need to be taken seriously because you don't, you're not convicted enough to take action behind what you believe and, what, you know, that would change to help the masses. Um, so either, <laughs> it doesn't sound harsh, I don't mean to say be harsh, I just want to be real, it's like, hey, listen, join an organization or shut up, to be honest, I'm, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, so thank you guys for <laughs> listening to another episode of the Pantula Podcast. Catch you guys on the next episode and forward ever. Forward ever, backwards, never. Forward.